everyone. I'm glad you found us today. Welcome. I would like to share my screen to show you some of the resources we'll be looking at. Thank you for your patience. We're all navigating new technology. We have a new screen for older adults. I won't scroll down because it's a little distracting to watch that, but I wanted you to know that um, there are many resources. If you scroll down what we call in newspaper world below the fold and then open the plus signs and make sure you go to the left and right to see the different carousels, you'll see lots of different events, book lists, resources to keep folks busy and socially connected during quarantine. I will show you if you click on search the catalog, instead of looking at the catalog, search events. And I'll show you one of our top sellers, if you will, our wisdom cafes. I'm just putting in the keyword wisdom for search events. And these are discussion groups pertaining to topics around aging. Fridays, the surprises of aging, that's one of my favorite topics. You'll see later on, we have them on Tuesdays and they're facilitated discussions without even the barrier of having to read a book. So I invite you to check that out later. I'm going to launch a poll after I um, sh stop sharing my screen. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And we'd like to know how you found out about us today. So I'm going to launch the poll. And if you would click in your box to see, did you see it on kcls.org? Did you see it on Nextdoor? Did you read about it in a newsletter? Word of mouth. That's very helpful for us in our planning. We want to know how our promotional efforts are going and how you found out about it. Oh, so far, lots of people found out from word of mouth, and some folks found out about it in a newsletter. Next door, that's a great place for local events if you haven't joined your local nextdoor.com and saw it on kcls.org. So most folks heard it from uh, word of mouth. All right, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, someone else is putting in the chat box. I saw it on Facebook. Great. Thank you for that, uh, for that feedback. All right, I'm gonna close out the poll and turn it over to my colleague, Jill. Thanks, Wendy. I'm Jill Morrison and I'm a librarian at the Redmond Library. I wanna thank the Friends of the Redmond Library for their support of this program today. It's wonderful to be online because it gives us at King County Library System the opportunity to provide programming throughout the whole county, not just at Redmond. We also have, if you want, more resources as Wendy was showing on our online library that you can also go to eBooks and audiobooks through Overdrive for more reading and resources on this subject. I'm thrilled to introduce Allison Schreier. Allison has presented How to Be a Friend to Someone with Dementia twice at the Redmond Library, and both times I came away better informed and had a greater understanding of dementia and how to be a friend. So please welcome Allison. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. It's a real pleasure to be here today. I too have a poll, I think. Let me see. Do I have a poll, Genesee? Yes, you do. <laughs> Go ahead and click on polls and then the little down arrow. I see it now, there we go. Uh, just out of the gates, I'm just wondering what your connection is to dementia. Because we're recording and the recording will not pick this up, I'm going to go ahead and read out the questions. I have a diagnosis of dementia or mild cognitive impairment. I don't have a diagnosis, but I'm concerned about my own memory or cognitive ability. I am concerned about a friend or family member who does not have a diagnosis. I have a friend with dementia. I have a family member with dementia. No personal connection. I'm just here to learn. 
thank you so much for taking the time to fill this in. So we have quite a few family members with us today and people who are friends. Awesome. Thank you for doing that. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And I'll share the results. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oops, there we go. And begin. So thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation about how and why to be friends with people living with dementia. So a little bit about what brings me to this topic. I was in my 20s when my parents split up and they each wound up marrying somebody who went on to get dementia in their 80s. My stepdad had vascular dementia, my stepmom most likely Alzheimer's disease. My closer connection is in my own family. Oh, let me see. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, and uh, my husband was one of the rare 5% or fewer of people who developed dementia younger than the age of 65. He was in his 40s when he was diagnosed with something called frontotemporal dementia. You see him there in June of 2018 with our kids. They were 12 and 15 at the time of his diagnosis. And we lost him a little over a year ago. So I come to this topic from the perspective of a family member who was caring for somebody uh, at home, uh, as well as family members from a distance who were learning how to deal with dementia. Since then, I've gone on to study with some amazing people, and I have several different projects that I'm involved in that, are, uh, that have to do with dementia. The first is that three days a week, I'm at the University of Washington, where I'm in the Memory and Brain Wellness Center. There, I'm the program manager for that little program off to the right in the red circle called ECHO. ECHO is a program that provides education to primary care providers in rural and underserved populations in Washington state to up their game around dementia detection, diagnosis, and support. But the real reason I'm showing you this screen is because the Memory and Brain Wellness Center's website is a great resource for family members and friends of people living with dementia, community events and programs, all kinds of talks, and they have support groups, both for people with a diagnosis and for family members. I will say out of the gates that I think the first thing that you need to do if you're a family member is find yourself a support group because I don't know how I would have gotten uh, through this without my own support group. I also teach classes. I'm a contractor through the Department of Social and Health Services where I teach full day dementia and mental health classes to professional caregivers. These are classes that are mandated by Washington State the reason I'm showing you this screen is because DSHS is also a great resource for you. They have all kinds of resources online for family caregivers, including support groups and activities that would be great for you to know about. Including from that same website, the Dementia Roadmap, which is a great, um, it's exactly what it, what it says. It's a roadmap. We've got a diagnosis, now what? You can, through their website, uh, have them send you copies or you can download it and print it yourself. And finally, my passion project is something uh, that I is my response to the fact that when my husband went to live in a long term care community, I found that he watched way too much terrible TV that was not really appropriate for a person whose brain was not what it once was. So this is a project where we have created custom programming for people who are living with dementia and we are looking for people to try it out and let us know what they think. There are lots of different videos, it's free, um, including videos that are intended to help promote activities that are sometimes not the easiest when somebody has dementia. So enough about me, I want to talk about why we're all here. I'll read this out loud. It's a quote by Dr. Richard Taylor, who himself had dementia. He died of cancer 
um, in 2015. He says, after I was diagnosed, my friends stopped coming around to see me. Finally, I called one of them and asked him, why don't you come see me anymore? And he said, Richard, I just don't know what to say. And I said, how about hello? This really speaks to me because one of the things that I found as a family member supporting somebody living with dementia was that a lot of people did stop coming around. And I understood that it was because they were afraid. They didn't know how to be with somebody with dementia. Um, what happens if he got upset? What happens if they ran out of things to talk about? And so one of my missions in life became to help people be better prepared to communicate with people who are living with dementia. Dr. Taylor was the founder of the Dementia Alliance International. That is a group that is specifically for people who are living with a diagnosis. It's an advocacy group. And I highly recommend this to people who are recently diagnosed and want to um, do what they can to promote understanding and acceptance and to get rid of stigma. So the goals for our session today, one is to just make sure we are all on the same page about what is dementia. A lot of people say, well, it's about memory loss. And people say, well, it's the same thing as Alzheimer's disease. And while those are certainly connected, that's not what dementia is. I want you to understand what is normal aging versus Alzheimer's disease. We'll take a look at how dementia impacts a person's abilities and skills. We'll get some lessons from some of my heroes in the world of dementia. And the big goal is to understand how to be a compassionate communicator with a person with dementia. As we go through this session, I'll be sharing with you, as I already have, resources that I think might be helpful to you. So first, what is dementia? Well, it turns out there's not actually a diagnosis that's called dementia. There are 100 or more diseases that qualify as a dementia. These days, we think of Alzheimer's as being the one that is most prevalent. But as you can see, vascular, Lewy body, and frontotemporal dementia are all some of the more common forms of the disease. So dementia is actually a, a, an umbrella term for a bunch of symptoms. There are four things that are true in order for something to qualify as a dementia. The first is that it impacts at least two parts of the brain. And those parts of the brain translates to skills. So the skills that I lose are based on what form of dementia that I have because that dictates the parts of the brain that are impacted. The second is that it's chronic. I don't some days have dementia and other days I don't have dementia, although my symptoms may vary from day to day. The third thing is that it's progressive. I want to pause for just a moment on that progressive piece. If we think of dementia as a flower that's blooming, it's a flower that takes probably 20 years to bloom. We know that dementia is already building up in the brain long before one becomes symptomatic. It's important to understand that because one of the things I'll be emphasizing today is that the earlier that we get a diagnosis, the more likely that we are to um, stave off the worst symptoms for a longer period of time. So what doctors and researchers are really focused on these days is not so much a cure, but more, how do we extend that period of time between when the seed is planted and when the flower blooms? And then the fourth thing that is true of all dementias is that they are fatal. So dementia actually causes brain atrophy. The brain shrinks. And by the time a person dies from dementia, their brain could be about a third less the size of a healthy brain, third less than the size of a healthy brain. So cells are actually withering and dying and the connections between those cells are going away. If we focus for a minute on Alzheimer's disease, because that is the most prevalent dementia, here you'll see what I mean by two parts of the brain. So with Alzheimer's disease, for instance, the parts of the brain that are impacted are the temporal lobes and the hippocampus. So why do you care about that? Because it impacts how the person will behave. So if they have Alzheimer's disease, disease the temporal lobes are responsible for language. And you can see on your left-hand side that 
that little box that says language, that's a pretty healthy, meaty looking piece of brain, as opposed to other over on the right hand side, there's much more space and the, the actual flesh of the brain has grown smaller. The way that this manifests is that in the beginning, somebody might start maybe using the wrong word, like instead of asking you to pass the salt, you say, please, or, pass the salt, you say, please pass the sugar. So there are probably some of you out there like clutching your chest right now saying, oh my God, I just did that. We all do that. We do that from time to time. We're distracted. It's if I continue to do it over and over again and it worsens that I start thinking, hmm, maybe there's something else going on here. Eventually what will happen is that I will start to kind of slur words and people eventually wind up with what we call word salad where they sound like they're speaking gibberish. Their cadence is good. The rhythm is good but the words don't make any sense to us, although they make sense to the person speaking. And some people lose language altogether. They simply stop talking. The memory piece for people living with Alzheimer's disease, what's happening there is that that hippocampus, which on the left side is big and beefy and in the right side is much more smaller and there is a hole. That's the part of our brain that's responsible for memory and wayfinding. The wayfinding piece is how do I get home from church? I was just walking down this block yesterday and now I'm here today and it looks completely unfamiliar. The memory piece is starts off with short term memory where people can uh, are losing the most recent events that have happened first. So it may be uh, we see this manifested as mom comes in and says, hey, sugar, what time are we having dinner? And I say, well, mom, we're going to be eating at about five o'clock. And she says, OK, because I'm going to um, you know, I got to get the things. And then I, I just am wondering what time are we eating? We're eating at five o'clock, mom. Okay. And then she asks me six more times as a family member or a friend. It's really easy to get frustrated about this. You just asked me that question. But what we have to understand is that it's kind of like a bookshelf that part of the brain and the information we're eating at five o'clock is going for storage, but there's no shelf for it to settle on. There is no there there. And so consequently, the person has no sense that they recently asked that question. If I berate them and remind them that they just asked me that question, all I do is make them feel really bad about themselves. Instead, as a friend, as a family member, I do things like gently repeat myself, I might write it down and hand them a piece of paper. I might write it on a chalkboard and I say, check the chalkboard, mom. One of my heroes in the dementia world is Dr. Um, Brock Gaster. He's with the Memory and Wellness Center. And I like what he says down here that his goal is to educate primary care physicians in how to identify dementia earlier. As I mentioned previously, it's really important that we try to diagnose dementia as early as possible in the disease because that promotes better care. Also, you guys, it allows us to figure out, is it really dementia? Because 10% of the time, it's not. It could be a vitamin B12 deficiency. It could be a thyroid issue. Um, it could be a terrible sleep apnea. So if I have somebody who is hesitant to go see a doctor, I say, hey, if we find out that it's something that's not dementia, we can fix it and make it so that you don't get dementia. Earlier diagnosis is important because it allows us to do advanced care planning. I've put a website up there for Dr. Gaster's work, which explores how I, as a person with a diagnosis, might want to handle, make decisions about my treatment later on, depending on where I am in the stage of the disease. Tracy Kidder is a nonfiction author. In his book, Strength in What Remains, which is not about dementia, he says, in order to go on with our lives, we are always capable of making the ominous into the merely strange. So while that was not written about dementia, to me, it really speaks about what it's like when somebody is first starting to become symptomatic, that we have a tendency to mm, think that maybe it's something else. Well, you know, he hasn't really been sleeping that well. And well, work's been really busy. And I don't know, I've just had so much going on. And there's that stuff going on with the grandkids. If you think that there's a possibility that it might be dementia, I highly recommend that you go see um, your doctor. How big a problem is it? Dementia is a really big uh, problem in our society. The third leading uh, 
the third uh, leading cause of death in Washington state. 2016 numbers are 107,000 people going to 270,000 by 2040, with three over 300,000 unpaid family caregivers taking care of people in Washington state. That's a lot of people. Uh, in the United States right now, it's about 5.6 million people expected to be 14 million people by 2040. From Dr. Gaster, there is this slide that explains like, wow, why are there going to be so many more people with dementia? And it is because of our baby boomer population. The greatest predictor of whether, whether you will get dementia next year is how old you are. By the time you're 65, statistically, you have about a 10% chance. By the time you're 85, it's closer to 35 or 40%. So therefore, the folks in the oldest age category are the ones who are most likely to be impacted. So there's our baby boomers, and that's where they're going to be 12 years from now. So there's a much larger percentage of our population that's going to be in the right age frame to be able to um, possibly get a diagnosis. Hmm. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about how do, we, how do we communicate with people who um, have dementia? So Dementia Friends is an organization that is all about proliferating education about how to communicate properly with people living with dementia. And I have done some work with them teaching some of their classes. There are five key messages that I think are pretty important are number one, recognize that dementia is not a normal part of aging. Yeah, the bad news is that by the time you're 85, there's like a 35 to 40% chance that you're going to have dementia, but there's a much greater chance that you're not going to have it. Dementia is caused by diseases of the brain. It is not somebody acting willfully. It is not somebody just trying to be difficult. Dementia is not just about memory problems. My husband, until shortly before his death, received visits from people he hadn't seen in years. He knew who they were. His dementia did not impact memory. It is possible to have a good quality of life with dementia. Many people are doing it. And there is more to the person than their dementia. That question, what would happen if we assumed that everyone in our life was actually doing the best they could? I actually put a huge piece of paper on my bedroom wall and on it, I wrote in big letters, he is doing the best he can to constantly remind myself that my husband was not being willful. A little bit about normal aging versus Alzheimer's disease. So memory loss that disrupts daily life. We all have memory issues from time to time. We forget things. How many of you have stood in front of the refrigerator, you open up the door and you stand there looking inside and you say, wow, why am I here? That's not dementia, that's distraction. Memory loss that is not dementia looks like this. I leave my house, I'm uh, heading out the door, I throw on my coat and I see my dog lying on the sofa. I look at him and I say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to feed you. I go back into the kitchen. As I reach the kitchen, I get a call from my sister. Now, I can keep between five and eight things in my working memory at any point in time, as can most people with a healthy brain. What's in my brain right now is feed the dog. But I get that phone call from my sister and she wants to know if I'm going to mom's house for this thing. Am I, am I gonna be bringing this particular dish that I like to make? And is, do you think it's okay if my sister brings her boyfriend? Well, I don't know. And then the next thing I know, when I hang up the call, I have no idea why I'm in the kitchen because feed the dog has been replaced. So with my big meaty healthy brain, I am able to stop and pause. I have my coat on. Okay, I was leaving. But why did I come to the kitchen? I can't figure it out. So what do I do? I retrace my steps. I find the dog and I say, oh, buddy, I'm so sorry. I feed him and leave. That's, that's normal memory problems. On the other hand, if I was somebody who was living with a dementia that causes memory impairment, that same story would play out differently. I put on my coat, I see the dog, I go to the kitchen, I get the phone call. Now, when I hang up the phone, I notice I have my coat on and it's kind of hot, so I take off my coat. And I notice that there are dishes in the sink. So maybe I do the dishes. Maybe I make a pot of coffee. 
Maybe eventually the dog comes in and nudges me and I feed him. Maybe it's the eighth time that day that I'm feeding him. So the big difference is that if I am living with memory loss from dementia, I don't recognize that I have forgotten something. I may have challenges in planning or problem solving. We all run into that from time to time. I'm distracted, I'm moving too fast, I didn't sleep well. It's different when I'm living with dementia. An example, my husband was making a ham and cheese sandwich. I watched as he got the bread, went to the refrigerator, got the cheese, got the ham, grabbed a jar of mayonnaise, went to the drawer and pulled out a knife, set it all out on the counter. And then after a pause, he started banging on the counter with his fists and yelling because he couldn't figure out what the first step was in that process. That kind of procedural memory, loss of that kind of procedural memory is common in different kinds of dementias. Difficulty completing familiar tasks at home, at leisure or at work. I think about my stepdad and about the time that my mom called me and she said, so Ken has a routine. Ken's routine is that he gets up in the morning and he makes the coffee. Then he grabs his newspaper and he turns on the TV and he sits while the coffee is brewing. Well, today I got up and Ken had put the half and half right into the coffee machine. I don't know what to do with him. I guess I need to take that away from him. We're gonna pause there and go to the next slide for a moment. I'm introducing you to one of my heroes, Dr. Ellen Power. Dr. Power introduces in his book, and I've also had the pleasure of hearing him lecture several times, a concept called cognitive ramps, which I would like to share with you today. And by the way, at his website, he also has videos that you might be interested in watching. When I heard him lecture, he said, imagine that here I am to speak with all of you today. And how fortunate we are because I have a colleague who's joining us from South Africa. He's come all the way here from South Africa. And imagine that at the back of the auditorium, the door opens and my colleague who's in a wheelchair rolls down the aisle and he gets to the front of the stage and he looks at me and he looks at the stairs and he looks at me. Oh, I forgot to set up a ramp so that he could make it on stage. And Dr. Power asks, do you think he'd be a little upset? Do you think he'd be a little frustrated that he can't do the thing that he came here to do? And the answer is yes. Might he even lash out and act out a little bit because of that? Yes, he might. So what Dr. Power says is, just like I should have created a physical ramp for him, for people who are living with dementia, one of the ways that we are a good family member and a good friend is that we provide cognitive ramps. We anticipate where they might have problems and we preemptively put solutions in place so that they can succeed. Think about this. People with dementia have lost so much. They've lost extrinsic things like they don't let me drive anymore. They don't leave me alone with the grandkids. I'm not allowed to cook. And I've lost intrinsic skills. I don't do things as well as I used to. So therefore, we want to allow people to have as many successes as they can in their lives. So what I say to my mom is, hey, mom, let's put some cognitive ramps in place. Don't just take away making the coffee. One of the worst things that you can do for somebody living with dementia is take away their things that they do well and maybe not so well anymore, but to take away their routine. We want Ken making coffee every day. That's how he identifies him with himself. I'm the guy who makes the coffee in the morning. So what can we do? Well, maybe we can put a sign on the coffee maker that says water goes here. Or maybe we put a pitcher of water next to the coffee maker so that we're sure that he grabs that instead of going to the refrigerator looking for the cream. Similarly, people might be confused with time or place and there are ramps that we can put in place to help them deal with that. Let me explain what I mean. People often think of dementia as being like, oh, I, yeah, they've got this memory thing going on. So now they're living in like 1983. And then next week, they'll be living in like 1979. And then it'll be like 1943 before we know it. That's not really the way that it works. What happens is that there is confusion about different events that have happened at different times in my life and where they plug into the now. It's sort of this layering of memories that stops making sense. So story, 
there's a gentleman who lives in a condo in Bellevue. He's lived there for 11 years with his wife. He has dementia. In his condo in Bellevue, there is a lovely big kitchen. In the kitchen, there is a door. And if you open that door, you wind up in a beautiful and well-appointed pantry. In the house that he grew up in, in Idaho, there is a great big kitchen. It looks nothing like the kitchen in Bellevue. However, that kitchen also had a door. And if you opened that door, you would be in a bathroom. His wife in Bellevue is wondering why he is peeing in the pantry. It's because his brain isn't working. He has a memory from long ago that bathrooms, that there's a, if there's a door in a kitchen, that doors lead to bathrooms. And even though this kitchen looks nothing like that kitchen, there's this weird layering that's happening. So think about this for a moment. What can I do to create cognitive ramps to allow this gentleman to be successful? Hmm. I could put a sign. I could put a sign on the door that says pantry. I could put a sign on the floor because some people look down a lot when they have dementia. A sign on the floor that says pantry. Um, I could take off the door. That would eliminate the problem. What families will do are things like use tape maybe to make arrows that lead to the bathroom, blue tape. So when he comes into the kitchen and he's got to use the restroom, his wife can say, follow the arrows, honey, just follow the arrows. With dementia, number five, people will have trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. Normal aging is that our eyes are not as good as they once were. I didn't always wear glasses. Visual processing is deeply impacted by dementia, as is just processing in general, the speed with which our brains can accomplish tasks. So one of the things that happens is that because my ability to process information is diminished, my field of vision narrows. It's not that I can't see things that are off to my left and off to the right, but my field of the area that I'm able to process gets smaller. What this manifests as sometimes, uh, and something that I hear a lot from family members is, oh my God, I can't get him to walk with me. He walks behind me. Everywhere I go, I'm like, I know he can walk a normal speed. Come on, walk beside me. He won't do it. Why? Because if he walks beside you, he can't see you. It's almost like somebody is wearing a scuba mask by the time they're fairly early in their dementia. So as somebody who is a friend to somebody living with dementia, maybe I'm just okay with it. Maybe I stop giving them a hard time about it. Maybe I recognize that they're doing the best they can. Maybe I slow way down. I build extra time into our walk and maybe we're not gonna walk a mile. Maybe it's going to be a quarter mile and maybe my arm will be hooked in that person's arm. Recognition of colors can also be challenging for people living with dementia. Dark spots on floors can look like holes and be very, very scary. Busy patterns can be confusing. My husband would walk into my white bathroom, white floors, white walls, white toilet, shut the door and pee on the wall. What do I do? Cognitive ramps. Replace the toilet seat with something that's a dark color. Put something around the rim like red tape so that he can see it. If I'm helping him get dressed in the morning and I'm laying his clothes out, I wouldn't want to put his beige pants and his beige sweater on the beige bedspread because it will be hard for him to see. My husband would clean the kitchen counter and it looked like he cleaned it with a fork. There are still crumbs all over the place. He was not able to see them. Rather than get on him about it, I just accept that that's the disease. And when I ask him to clean up, I say, awesome job. And then when he leaves, I wipe the counter myself. New problems with words and speaking, words and speaking or writing with number six. Yeah, that has to do with that language piece that people, uh, as we already described, lose the ability to process words. And what I do is I listen for their cadence. I listen for their rhythm. I do a lot of, huh, wow, awesome. 
I'm not trying to be condescending and I'm not trying to be mean or dismissive. I'm trying to follow the emotion of the conversation if I can't follow the words. Number seven, misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps, um, which is what we described earlier, right? That I might not be able to retrace my steps. Missing, misplacing things all the time. I hear this from families everywhere. And there's a lot of um, using those little things that you can put, uh, square is it? That you can, no, I forget. Anyway, that you can put in something so that you can find it later. Um, decreased or poor judgment. Yep. My husband became very, very involved in this game called Magic the Gathering, where you build card decks and play other people. And I discovered that he was spending $400 a week on cards. We all make bad choices from time to time, but when my brain is not working well, I make choices that seem perfectly logical to me that don't make sense to the rest of the world. Withdrawal from work and social activities. Think about this, by the time somebody is in early stages of dementia, because of their brain processing capabilities, they're missing about one in every four words. So what does that mean? It means it's hard for me to follow conversations. I'm starting to feel a little dismissed. I'm starting to feel a little like I can't keep up. So my tendency is to want to kind of pull away. We need to embrace people and pull them back in. We need to give people time to be able to follow the conversation. And if they change the conversation to something that they're familiar with, I go along with it. There was a fellow who talked about how his wife no longer wants to socialize with the couples that they always socialized with for years. Why, he said. And she said, because they make me feel stupid. Same thing my husband said when he was doing volunteer work. He stopped because he said, they make me feel stupid. You need to be careful about that. Changes in mood and personality. I wish that somebody had said to me that personality change is not a normal thing. My husband became a different person. And if I had known that personality changes aren't just something that happens as people evolve, I don't know. I think I would have um, more aggressively uh, sought help. We did, it took us six years to find a diagnosis, but it never occurred to me that dementia might be the thing that was causing those personality changes. Another one of my heroes is Tipa Snow. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate uh, about Tipa um, is that she is an occupational therapist who for the last 30 years has developing, been developing methods for people to um, assist those living with dementia in hands-on practical ways. I encourage you to check out her website. She's got tons of videos that um, explain how we do things with people instead of doing things for people so that people can remain a partner in their own life and in their own care for a much longer period of time, which improves the way that they see themselves and their outlook on the world. She's very, um, she's really keen on this idea of responding, not reacting, of educating myself so that I understand how somebody might behave when they have dementia so that I can respond to them appropriately rather than getting my back up and getting agitated. She does offer support groups. Anybody who wants to can get a free 30 minute consultation, which I think is pretty awesome. And she has a conference in November, which is I went to last year and it was amazing. Just an example of the kinds of uh, tools that she has available for free on her website. Um, just quick reminders about what is dementia? How do I know if it's dementia? How can I best assist someone? And she also has something called the positive approach, which is that I approach people from the front. Why? Because they have limited vision. And if I approach from the side, I might alarm them. I always identify myself. When I encounter somebody living with dementia, I say, hey, Allison, so good to see you. If I say, who am I? And I do see this a lot. People who say, who am I? Do you remember me? Which one am I, mama? Which one am I? Which one am I? That's trying to make myself feel better. I want to believe that they're really still there. I want to believe that I'm still important. 
but it can cause them to feel really horrible about themselves. I am putting someone in the position to answer a question to which they do not have an answer. And so I see a lot of this. Hey, do you remember me? And I see the person with dementia say, well, hang on. Um, I hold on. I, um, I, or they say, of course I remember you. And now they feel bad about themselves because they don't have any idea what the name is. Use somebody's preferred name, avoiding endearments like honey, sweetie, sugar. This is especially important, important for professional care providers who are younger and maybe caring for an older person. Speaking slowly and clearly, not loudly. Respecting processing time. It can take up to 20 seconds for a person with dementia to respond to a simple question. 20 seconds. Hey dad, what do you want for lunch? That's five seconds. Dad, did you hear me? What do you want for lunch? Give him the time to respond. Communicating with compassion. Reflect and validate emotions. Okay. Reflect and validate emotions means that when somebody is having a hard time, that I acknowledge that they're having a hard time and I validate that their emotional response to that is okay. Because people living with dementia are not always able to use their words to express discomfort or displeasure. Let me give you an example. I am on the East Coast playing cribbage with my mom and my husband. Cribbage, for those of you who don't play, card game, and I have a wooden board with holes in it, little metal pegs, and I move the pegs to keep track of my score. We're playing cribbage, my husband's turn to score, and he calculates that he has six points. So he takes the peg, and instead of going one, two, three, four, five, six, and moving six spaces, he starts saying some kind of like one, three, because he can no longer count, four, and he moves his peg about 40 spots and says six. I, who am well familiar with his abilities and inabilities at this point, say, oh my God, dude, you are rocking it. You are so going to win this game. My mom says, let me help you. No, 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 honey. Let me help you. She takes his peg out and goes one, two, three, four, five, six. So the question is, does he at that point say, <laughs> Kath, you're a peach. Thank goodness I have you on my side. No. He gets extremely upset because he just did the best he could. And she told him he was wrong. He doesn't want to hear he's wrong. He wants to hear that he's right. He wants to hear that he's got this. He wants to hear that he's okay. When he does get upset, I say, she just told you that you scored that incorrectly. That is so frustrating. That would make me very mad. I can see why you're mad. That's upsetting to hear somebody say that. Sometimes I match his emotion. I say, it's okay for you to feel that way. I offer comfort and reassurance. I check my own emotional state. It's not unusual for the care partner to sometimes behave more like the person with dementia than the person with dementia does. Because boy, do we get our buttons pushed on a regular basis and pushed hard. If I am not at my best place, I can't possibly support you in a compassionate and meaningful way. So sometimes I need to just leave the room. I need to count to 10. I need to take a deep breath. I need to have somebody else take him for a few hours so that I can have a little bit of time to myself. It is so important as caregivers that we take care of ourselves or we will not be able to take care of this person. Back to my initial statement that if you don't have a support group, get one. Boy, oh boy, do I mean that. 
If you don't have a solution in place for people to spot you so that you can take breaks, please, please do that for yourself. You deserve it. Respect this person's reality. It's not our job to correct them. So when mom comes downstairs and she's got three sweaters on and I say, you're going to be hot. And she says, no, I'm not. Because what I've just said is you screwed up. What I've just said is what you've done is not okay. Instead, I say, wow, you're looking sharp. If I'm concerned that she's going to be hot, let's wait till we get outside. And then maybe if she starts to get hot, we can start peeling off sweaters. We can get into trouble when we do reality checking. Staying with my dad and my stepmom, I noticed that she was forgetting a lot. She would say she was going to do something, then she wouldn't do it. I would tell her a story, and then when I went to do some follow-up, she would say I'd never told her that story. So I would say, I did tell you. I told you. I didn't know then what I know now. And I would say, I told you. My God, I've told you like six times. What happened is that she was put in a position of needing to make a choice. There were one of two possibilities. One was that she was losing her mind. Two is that I'm a liar. And her choice was that I'm a liar. So I got kicked out of the house. What should I have done? Is pretended like it was the first time that I was telling her. And when I got fed up, I needed to take breaks. Avoid open-ended questions. What do you want for lunch can become a big question because there are so many possibilities. Even looking at a menu, first of all, are they even able to read the menu anymore? You might not know because people can be pretty good at masking. So what I might do instead of saying, what do you want for lunch is say, do you want the ham sandwich or do you want the turkey sandwich? Instead of saying, what do you want to wear today? I might say, you know what? You look so awesome in that flowered shirt. Do you want to wear that flowered shirt or do you want to wear this striped shirt today? Do you want to go to QFC or do you want to go to Fred Meyer instead of where do you want to go grocery shopping? Choices are awesome, by the way. Choices are a way for a person to be involved in their care. Every time I answer a question, I am making a decision about my care and that makes me feel good about myself. By talk to me, I mean don't talk over the person who's living with dementia. Don't talk around them. It really drove me nuts, especially at doctor's offices when this would happen. I'm sitting next to my husband and the doctor looks at me and asks questions that my husband is still capable of answering. And even when he is no longer capable of answering, ask the questions to him and I will pop in and help when needed. Don't argue. You will never win an argument with a person living with dementia. And avoid things like logic and reasoning. Um, trying to explain, well, you see, we need to leave now because there's going to be a lot of traffic. And if we don't leave, it's going to be really hard. Um, respecting apathy. I just popped that in there recently because this is a question that I get a lot is people say, you know, he doesn't want to go for walks. The doctor said that he should be walking every day, but he doesn't want to go for walks. And he gives me a big argument. And so therefore every day I say, let's go for a walk. And he fights with me. We want to avoid fights. So sometimes we need to respect the fact that as people's dementia progresses, they don't want to do the same things as much anymore. And sometimes we need to reframe the way that we do the ask. Instead of saying, do you want to go for a walk? I might say, um, hey, let's go mail these letters. Or I might say, um, let's go see how many dogs we can count in the neighborhood. I turn it into something that might be a little more interesting than just a walk. But if at the end of the day he says, no, I absolutely refuse to walk, there's not a whole lot I can do about that. And that's hard as a care provider, as a care partner to accept that things are actually changing, but they are. And I use a lot of nonverbal cues, can, which can be really helpful for people living with dementia. Do you want to get a drink? I pat the chair. Do you want to sit down? I point to the place that we're going. So back to my hero, Dr. Alan Power. 
I talked earlier about his idea of cognitive ramps. I want to talk now about another uh, concept that he shares in his book, Dementia Beyond Disease, which is called the Dementia Domains of Well-Being. What he shares with the Dementia Domains of Well-Being is that if we help a person living with dementia accomplish each of these or have access to each of these items, identity, connected, security, autonomy, meaning, and growth, that they will be able to experience joy even though they are a person living with dementia. And this has borne out in research. Dr. Power talks about a community in Arkansas that um, followed a model that he describes in his book in which he says, imagine a person who is uh, living with dementia, ha imagine that they have six cups in front of them. And one is the cup that contains, contains their sense of identity. One is the cup that contains their sense of connectedness, security, autonomy, and so on. What he maintains is that if any one of those cups were to allow to be empty, that that person is far more likely to have behavioral expressions that get them in trouble. And so he talks, going back to, the, he talks about a community in Arkansas where they put this into play. This is a care community where they had some of the people who were most challenged, who were being given drugs to calm them down because they would get so upset about things. And they said, let's actually look at these people from this perspective. Let's imagine that they've got these six cups in front of them. Are any of them empty? And what they discovered is that, yeah, there's this lady, for instance, who we don't let her do anything for herself anymore because she's so slow. We tie her shoes, we pull her clothes on her, we scrub her when she's showering. Could she still do it herself? Yes, but it takes forever. So her autonomy glass is empty. And what they find is if they let that cup fill back up again, let her start doing more things for herself, that her entire frame changes and that she is far less likely to have outbursts because she is a more joyful person. So they discovered at this care community in Arkansas that this made a positive change. They then applied it to other communities in Arkansas and the state of Arkansas has now adopted this as the methodology that they use to try to reduce the use of drugs to improve behaviors in care communities in Arkansas. And what they have found statewide is that it has made a hugely, profoundly dramatic change in the way that they are managing um, people in care communities and that the uh, drug use in the entire state has gone way down because people are not getting as upset. So let's talk about how we apply this as friends and as family members. So identity. It's really important that we help people who are living with dementia retain a sense of identity, which is a combination of who I was and who I am. So for instance, if I have a friend who is a big gardener, maybe what I wanna do is early on in their dementia, I want to go work in their garden with them or better yet, have them work in my garden. Maybe I want to go with them to the Arboretum or the Botanical Gardens. As time goes on and they're less capable, I want to maybe take them to Mulbacks to go look at plants. Maybe I bring a plant to their house in a pot. Maybe we set up a little garden on their porch. Maybe we look at gardening books as their dementia progresses further. In care communities, people do things like a fellow who was a doctor still wears a lab coat. Somebody who was an architect, they set up a drafting table so that person is still able to do drafting. Not for real, but they give that person blueprints and they ask them to explore the blueprints and identify the things that they might change. The next is a sense of connection. Retaining connectedness is so important. Connection to myself, connections to my community. So what does this look like? This looks like our friend Don, who would pick my husband up and take him to the gym. 
In the beginning, they would go there and they would work out together. As time went on, they would drive to the gym. My husband would walk in and he would get a drink of water and then he would want to leave. And Don, being a good friend, would say, okay. And my husband would come back and he would say, that was a great workout. He still identified himself as a guy who worked out at the gym and going to the gym helped him feel like he was connected to that community. He had another friend who would pick him up and take him to cut Taekwondo. We can take people to church. We take people to the community center. My comment down here that it's okay to just be, sometimes we establish connection simply by being with a person. A question that people would ask me when they would visit my husband later in his disease is, how do I be with a person who can't talk? Like he doesn't communicate with me anymore. That's really hard. So sometimes we just be, we sit in a room together and we look at books or we watch, uh, this was the intention with Zinnia TV, is that we have shows that are intended to draw connections for people. We look at coffee table books. We listen to the birds. I rub their feet. I rub their hand. I talk. I talk about the things that we have done together. And I don't talk about it in a melancholy, wistful way. I talk about it almost as though it's still happening. Like, I love skiing with you. Skiing with you is awesome. Because boy, oh boy, do we ever like to go off trail and we go amongst those trees connection to something that they have always loved to do. Momentia is a fabulous organization. It's not really an organization. It's a movement. It's a grassroots movement that empowers people with memory loss and their loved ones to remain active, connected, and active in the community. What you see on the screen is a screenshot from their website. Not right now, because during these times of quarantine, there are not activities that we can actually attend together, but there will be again. And the Momentia website is chock-a-block full of activities that you can do with your loved one at home. Momentia is where I would go, for instance, at 9.30 on a Monday morning to a zoo walk that's just for people like me, a partner or a friend to somebody with dementia. And if I'm a little uncomfortable being with somebody who's with dementia, it's fabulous that I can be in a community of people who are all in the same place so that if somebody starts getting amped up, if somebody starts having issues, everybody there understands there's no judgment. There are weekly sing-alongs, bell choir, dancing. There are programs at the Fry Art Museum. I highly recommend that you help the person who you are supporting remain connected by doing some of the activities that are available through Momentia. It would also be negligent not to mention the Alzheimer's Association. The Washington State Chapter, this is their website. You'll notice that there's a box for I have Alzheimer's and there's a, a box for caregiving and a box for community. It's another mechanism for me to find out online of ways that I can get support both for myself and the person living with dementia and opportunities for us to remain connected to community. Another one of Dr. Power's boxes in the dementia domains of well being was security. Familiarity breeds a sense of security. It's so important for us to have access to the familiar. So, therefore, friends who come visit me, family taking me places that I remember or talking about things that have been important to me. One of the things that I hear from people is the lament that. Um, she doesn't know me anymore. I go there, I sit with her. I'm telling you, I talked to her for like 20 minutes and I don't think she ever connected who I was. While somebody with dementia may not know who I am, there is still this sense that they know that they know me. They may not be able to place me, but they know that they know me. Maybe I'm just that nice lady. I'm not her daughter anymore, but I'm still the nice lady. And that time spent with that nice lady increases their sense of security because it is an attachment to the familiar. It's an important thing that we keep safety in mind. If we are 
sharing a space or bringing somebody with dementia into a space, that it's safe and welcoming. So we decrease physical and auditory clutter. I didn't really talk about auditory clutter. For a person who's living with dementia, it becomes increasingly difficult to parse where different noises are coming from. I'm in a space and there is music coming and there are people talking and that lady is chewing so loud and there's that person wheeling that card and it just becomes a cacophony in my head and I'm trying to process where it's all coming from and it can make me incredibly agitated. There was a point when we couldn't go to Costco anymore. We couldn't go to Trader Joe's anymore. We couldn't go to the mall. We couldn't be in places where there was so much activity because to try and make sense of all of that was frustrating. We need to be very in the moment with people who are living with dementia. This is something that I really stress to family members is to recognize that as a person living with dementia, really as all people, the past and the future are not where my attention needs to be. It needs to be on what's happening right now. A daughter takes her mom to Nordstrom. They come back to the care community where mom lives. And they're laughing. Oh my gosh, they've had such a great time for the past two hours. They've had an amazing time. They go upstairs with one of the care partners and the care partner says, you know, maybe mom needs a nap. And the daughter says, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes to use the bathroom, comes back out, mom. This is so awesome. Nordstrom next week. And mom looks at her and says, Nordstrom? Oh, I don't, I don't think so. And the daughter says, Nordstrom. We were just at Nordstrom. And the mom says, oh no, I, I don't really care for Nordstrom. And the daughter is like, we just spent two hours at Nordstrom. Hmm. And she's frustrated. Why should I keep taking her out? She doesn't remember that we were there. But the point is that while you were there, every one of those moments were a good moment. And that's what matters now. When I teach the full day dementia classes, the first message that I deliver is people will always remember how you made them feel. The part of the brain that hangs on to emotional memory remains intact in an astounding way. So what I would say to that daughter and what I would say to you is keep going to Nordstrom because afterwards mom doesn't really know why she's in a good mood, but she's in a good mood. And that's what we're looking for. Have a reconnection plan. I always made sure that my husband had his phone and that it was turned on ringer high volume so that I could find him if I lost him in a crowd. Autonomy. So one of the things that gives me security is the sense that I have some control over my life because I have had all of these losses. So therefore, I want to create opportunities for people to do things for themselves for as long as possible. And as I mentioned, Tipa Snow on her website talks about something called hand under hand connection. I encourage you to look up hand under hand connection because as dementia progresses, it's a way that I am able to assist somebody with daily care, brushing hair, brushing teeth, eating their meals in a way that allows me to support them doing it for themselves for a much longer period of time, which bumps up autonomy. We create autonomy by shift from doing for someone to doing with someone which means that we need to slow way down. We need to empower them to do what they can on their own and engage, help them engage with the world. How someone responds to you is a lesson about your own ability to communicate. Does that sink in for a second? Thinking back to my mom and cribbage, right? The lesson to her is, hmm, he's telling you, I didn't really like the way that you responded to me. Meaning, even with dementia, people need to have a sense of meaning in their lives. Ikigai from Japan means a reason to get up every day. When my husband could no longer be a software engineer at Microsoft, he was the guy who fed the fish. 
at the Issaquah Fish Hatchery. And as I mentioned, that lasted until mm, he felt like three people were kind of pulling away from him and treating him like he was not as good as they were. However, it gave him a great sense for a long time of feeling like he was still um, valued. And I'm not talking about just folding the sheets or folding the pillowcases. I'm talking about giving people tasks to do. It doesn't matter if they do it well. My friend Kevin's wife died from Alzheimer's disease, but she would do the dishes every day. That was her job. She would stack them up and she would stick the stack in the dishwasher and push the drawer in and he would wait until she left and then he would take them and put them properly in. When she would see them again, she never made the connection that they were not the way that she had put them. But he didn't berate her. He didn't say, no, you're not doing it right. He said, you're awesome. I'm so glad that we have you here to do the dishes. Robert Simpson died from Alzheimer's disease, but he and his wife wrote a book. And he said, I still want to be needed in some way. I would like you to talk things over with me, even if I can't respond well. I still need to hear I need you, even when I can't believe you do. Growth. People with dementia can still learn. So we have all these brain cells that are dying, but guess what? We also still have brain cells that are developing. It's important to give people who are living with dementia novelty. Let's do things we've never done before. Let's go places we've never been before. Let's have stories that we tell that we've never told before. Give people an opportunity to accomplish things. And then we don't, uh, and then we uh, acknowledge that and praise that. And that is how we find joy. Simple pleasures. So rather than simply a disease, dementia has purpose and meaning. Rather than being people simply living in need of our care, people who can forget can teach us about life and living. Rather than being a burden, people with dementia offer us an opportunity to deepen ourselves, to go deeper into our souls. I truly believe that. And that is the end of what I came here to say today. And we'll now open up to questions. Thank you so much, Allison. That was wonderful. I learned so much. That was just a fabulous presentation. We do have a couple of questions. The first one is, when the things that you describe start happening, how do you convince someone to go to the doctor for a diagnosis? Yeah, this is a huge problem. Um, so first of all, uh, for somebody over the age of 65, they should be getting a, um, a Medicare wellness visit every year that is supposed to include a cognitive assessment. Um, however, there are people who haven't been to the doctor in five years and they have no intention of going to the doctor. I think it's important, if at all possible, and I know I said like, don't use logic, don't use reasoning. But when somebody is fairly early in their progression, but like you know that there's something going on and they're not acknowledging it. Um, I think it's worth trying to have the discussion about the fact that um, there is something going on and it could be many things that, um, you know, I know that you feel like you're sleeping really well, but I have heard that a doctor can tell whether or not you're really sleeping well. And I noticed you're kind of tired some of the times, so, sometimes. So by going to the doctor, he can check and see if you're sleeping well and it's gonna make you sharper and it's going to make you live longer. You're going to live longer and healthier. So that kind of reasoning could possibly work. Otherwise, I look for other trusted people who could help suggest to that person that they might go to the doctor. Oftentimes it's the spouse and then they start butting heads. So if we bring somebody else in, if it's a pastor, if it is a, um, sometimes it can be one of the kids, 
Um, and it can also be the pretense for something else. If the partner, if I were to call the doctor and say, um, like right now with COVID, right? If I were to say to my husband, look, in a month, they might have a vaccination. We have to go get this vaccination or we have to go talk to the doctor about how we see, keep safe about COVID. I might come up with some other kind of pretense for getting there. I am not a big fan of lying. However, I am a big fan of making sure that we're doing the best that we can for the person who's living with dementia and ultimately for ourselves as well. If you can't get that person to go to the doctor, I would still make an appointment for me as the spouse to go talk to the doctor. Mm. Because the doctor might be able to give you some ideas, might be able to ask you some questions. They might have some little tests that you could do at home and you could share the results with the doctor. Because even without the diagnosis, um, there are still ways that we might want to modify our lifestyle and our behavior. Thank you so much. And speaking of going to the doctor, uh, someone asked, what do you do when it's time to leave, but the person doesn't want to? <laughs> when it's time to leave, like the doctor? Like get, getting to the doctor's appointment. Oh, and it's time to actually go to the doctor's office? Right. Um, we might want to have it not be about going to the doctor's office. What it might be is that we're going to go do something that that person really likes to do. So we're going to go to um, out to breakfast. We're, I'm going to time it at for 11 in the morning because he loves to go to breakfast. Great, let's go to, the, go to breakfast. Now you are in my car and you're captive. And we're going to go to the doctor's office. Um, that's one possibility. Otherwise, I think that um, trying to logic it out and reason, reason with the person and say, well, but we're going to be late. If we don't go now, we're going, oh, then you just start getting into a big argument. So um, I, I think that I would probably uh, either or just tell them that the appointment's at one and I would leave a whole, try to get into the car a whole lot earlier than that. Um, oh, and we could also do things like, oh my gosh, let's go get in the car. I've got this new music I want to listen to or play music that they really like. Um, let's go get an ice cream. Have it be something that is, uh, that they would actively want to do. Thank you. Does anyone else have any uh, questions? Someone's commenting that her mother was completely humiliated during the testing process and the tester would not let her be there with her. Refused yeah. to return for follow-up. And I'm going to respond to something that Mary Jean said. My mom was completely humiliated during the testing slash diagnosis, notably, noticeably upset. The tester would not let me be there with her. She refused to return for follow-up and I didn't make her uh, or trick her into going. It was heartbreaking. That is heartbreaking. As a family member, you should absolutely, absolutely be present with the person um, who is getting the diagnosis um, because there are questions that that person might not be able to answer accurately and your input is incredibly valuable. I would not go back to those same people because I don't think that you were treated well. I would, if your mom is, um, is open to it, to seeing somebody else, um, we could do that, but I would have a conversation with them first and share what my concerns are and make sure that we're not going to run into the same kind of problem. Thank you so much. Anyone else? We have a few minutes. Stephanie says, my grandmother scores well on the annual test, but the rest of the time there's obvious memory loss. How do I go about trying to get a more in-depth diagnosis for her when she insists that's enough? The rest of her problems are simply age related. Yeah, you know, people uh, have an amazing capacity to pull it together for mm -hmm. doctor's appointments. Not just doctor's appointments, but also for visits, right? So there will be the daughter who sees mom every single day and is absolutely acutely aware of what's going on with mom. And then the other daughter comes for a visit and says, I don't know what you're talking about. She's fine. She was fine with me. Because people do have this capacity to pull it together. I think that we need to, um, uh, once again, I think that it's important to have a conversation with the doctor. And I realize that we can only do that if mom has approved uh, me 
having access to the doctor. So that's something that we try to get fairly early on as well, is approval for us to be able to um, have those conversations with the doctor. Um, and I'm sorry, I got distracted looking at the, at the um, chats. I'm bad that way. Um, so I, I, so back to the question of she does great when she goes for her annual ex exams, but then she is like, there's obviously stuff going on. Um, so the question that I would have for mom and for the doctor is, can we rule out the other things that could possibly cause um, mild cognitive impairment? So mom, I'm not even, I don't think you have dementia. In fact, I, I don't think you have dementia at all. What I want to do is just make sure that you don't have a vitamin B12 deficiency, a sleep apnea, any of the other things that could possibly result in you getting dementia later on. Because if there's anything that we can fix, let's fix it now so that you never get dementia. So if it's a preventive type of visit, somebody might be more open to it. You know, a lot of people, as they get older, have these sleep issues that they don't even know about. Let's go talk to your doctor about it because we want your brain to be as healthy as possible for as long as possible. So let's make sure we're taking the right steps to keep you healthy. Great. And someone else is asking, is there any online preliminary testing that we could do before going to the doctor for a formal test? You know, yeah, I've seen things online. I, I can't point you to one, um, but there are absolutely um, t tests that you can do. So, so for instance, if you were to, um, and again, I'm not a medical professional, but if I were to say to everybody who's listening today, take out a piece of paper and set your timer for a minute and write as many animal names as you can. Just go, go. And you're just going to write as many animal names as you can. Well, one measure of whether or not I have something going on is how many names I'm able to come up with. A greater measure is how I respond to even being asked to do that. It, do I stop? Like I write aardvark and then I stop because I can't think of any more. Um, so while there are tests that you can take, what's more important almost is to look at the way that somebody responds uh, the, the way that somebody um, takes the test. So while there are things that you can look at online, I wouldn't use that necessarily as a diagnosis, but maybe as something that we um, track over time. So maybe today, hey, mom, I have this idea. Let's sit down and write as many animals as we can. Go. And today, mom gets 25. And then we do it in six months and she gets 17. Well, I'm seeing some change. Interesting. So we have about 10 minutes left. I want to put in a plug for uh, my, I don't want to say it's my favorite book, but I've been a librarian for 24 years. And in all that time, more people have come back to me about this book. It's Jolene Brackey's How, uh, I'm sorry, Creating Moments of Joy along the Alzheimer's journey. More people have come back to me about that book than all other books I've ever talked to patrons about combined. We do have it in the electronic book format as well as in print when our print collection is available again. So I take, take a look at that if you'd like. And we've got book lists and more on the website. If we don't have time to get to your question, please email Allison at Allison, A-L-L-Y-S-O-N at thrivingwithdementia.com. And she has invited your questions personally. So thank you so much, Allison. Sure. Anything sure. else? Great. Thanks for being here today. Uh, we have a few minutes left if anybody is interested in asking a couple more questions. But we do want you to know that we're hoping to put this on YouTube channel for King County Library System, so you'll be able to watch this later. And please get in touch with Allison at any time. Uh, we are also able to send you her slides that she used today, since there was a lot of information on those slides. And so if you want to, you can either reach out to me, morrison at kcls.org, or you can email Wendy Pender. And Wendy, you're gonna have to tell me your email. 
Yeah, that's fine. I'll be sending out the slide doc deck to everyone who's registered. Excellent. So you won't have you to so email much. me. Perfect. Um, we do have one uh, final question. How Excellent. do you how do you encourage someone with dementia when their previous abilities start to degrade? So you don't sound like you're talking down to them. They may be they may be aware of diminishing abilities and are upset by good job types of comments. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, so. <sighs> One of the things that I do, um, because I don't want to be condescending um, and, and praise you when you're able to empty the dishwasher when, like, you're an adult, you should be able to empty the dishwasher. So I avoid um, that kind of praise. Um, I can say thank you. It really helps me when you do that. Um, I try to treat somebody as much as possible like a... Um, like a, like they're a peer, you know, like we're, we're operating at the same um, level. Um, I'm wondering, I don't know, Nick, if you're able to type in a specific kind of, um, if there's something specific that you're thinking of. Um, I don't know. Uh, let's see. I don't have a specific, oh no, that's okay, that's okay. But I guess, I mean, I really avoid things like, oh my God, look at you, you tie your shoes. Like I would never say something like that because um, even though it was really a big deal that they tied their shoes, I'm just not even really gonna notice it. So I'm going to um, acknowledge a job well done with somebody living with dementia the same way that I would with somebody who isn't living with dementia. Um, and by encouraging people to do things, what I tend to do a lot of is encouraging people to help me. Hey, it would really be a big help for me if you would, um, if you would do this task. And maybe they get it done, maybe they get it a third of the way done. And I, I accept whatever they got done. And I just say, okay, awesome, thanks. Um, and that, that was a hard one for me. That took a while for me to not be like, I asked you to wash the carrots, you washed one. There were four carrots. Like, how hard is it to wash all four carrots? And then a, a fight would ensue. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to just kind of get over it and accept that uh, if one carrot got washed, awesome. But, but I'd have to go into it, honestly, expecting that I would need to wash all four carrots. Mm -hmm. if one got washed, great. I, you mentioned processing memory. When my mother um, was 103, she would say something like, I, I have to go to the bathroom. We'd get her up and into the bathroom. She would stand by the toilet and say, now what do I do? And I didn't know you could forget something like, now you have to pull down your pants, then you have to sit down, you know, and someone coached me that this is a sequence of behaviors that we learned as a child and you can forget that sequence. I was thinking, well, she's responding to a biological urge, just, Go with it. Nope. Had to remind her each step along the way. You bring up an excellent point. And I ran into this in a, in a care community where I happened to be there for something else. And I saw a lady sitting in front of her plate, four ladies sitting at a table uh, having breakfast. And one lady was just staring at her plate. And so I came over and I said, boy, that looks really good. And she said, she looked at me with, she said, does it? And I said, it does. And then I kind of stood and watched for a minute and I said, would you like to eat your breakfast? And she said, oh, I, should I? And I said, that would be a great idea. Yeah, eat your breakfast. And she said, okay. And then she just stared at it and I said, pick up your fork. And so she picked up her fork. And I said, poke the fork into the egg. So she poked the fork into the egg. I step by step got the egg, the fork into her mouth, got the fork back out again, coached her to chew. If you think of something even like brushing your teeth, you know, I will sometimes say to people, okay, write all the steps that are involved in brushing your teeth. And some people will have six steps and some people will have 18 steps and some people will have two steps, you know, go to the bathroom, brush your teeth. Like what's the big deal. But the reality is that finding the bathroom, knowing to pull open the drawer, to take out the toothpaste, to unscrew the cap. So what we do is we break things into smaller sequences. Instead of saying, honey, would you take out the garbage? What I might say is, hey, sweetie, would you tie the garbage bag off? 
Would you lift that out of the can for me? It's a little too heavy. Would you mind carrying that to the garage? Hey, while you're in the garage, I follow him. Would you go ahead and put that into the outdoor can? Sometimes, and I don't want this to sound like, oh, okay, I'm going to write, now I've got the secret. No, because there were plenty of times that he would then turn at me and say, stop telling me what to do. I mean, we're doing the best that we can, and it's not always going to work. I don't ever want to have it sound like I've got all the answers, and if you just follow my steps, life with a person supporting a person with dementia is going to be a piece of cake. It's never going to be a piece of cake. But there are things that we can do to try to avoid the upset, and avoiding the upset is what really um, kind of turned things around for me and made things easier to take. I like that phrase. I can remi remember that. Avoid the upset. Just yeah. agree. <laughs> sure. Let's do it your way. Thank you, Allison. We're going to have to wrap up. We have about, oh, one minute left at best. So well, thank, thank you so much for attending today. It was a real pleasure to have Allison. Uh, always learn something new. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.